Good morning, people of God. It's good to be with you this morning as we gather on this uh, uh, third Sunday of Easter. Um, if you want to fast forward and get right to the service, I invite you to do that. But as we get started, I just wanted to give you a few updates. Um, the first is about myself. And, and um, as you can see, I've got a new splint on my arm which means that I went to the doctor's office, the surgeon's office, on Tuesday and uh, got a good report. He took the stitches out and then sent me to rehab that same day in the office there with um, uh, the rehab lady, and she made me a custom red splint that I don't know how long I'll be wearing, and then we did uh, rehab. So many of you have sent me um, uh, get well cards and and some phone calls and emails and all of that, kind of wondering how I'm doing. So I wanted to give all of you an update at once. I'm doing well. My ribs are finally starting to heal. I can sneeze now without a tremendous amount of pain, which is a good thing. Uh, my wrist is getting better. I'm doing rehab to try to get some motion back in there. And um, so things are coming along well. Um, I'm always amazed at when I think of our little congregation here, how many people have been uh, uh, diagnosed either presumptive um, cases of uh, COVID-19 or tested positive. Um, most of our people have, uh, are recovering at home and are getting some of their strength back, and so we continue to pray for their recovery. As I filmed this, the last I knew, we have two people uh, still in the hospital or that were admitted back into the hospital um, this week. And so um, this is a Thursday afternoon. So by the time you watch this on Sunday morning, uh, there might be an update um, to that story. So keep all of our people in your prayers for uh, health and healing. And so far, God has been gracious in uh, allowing them to, to be restored to health. Last week, I, I got some comments on our service back, and, and they said, well, we don't like that view that you had when we were singing the hymns of, of the empty pews all the way to the back. Um, I kind of did that on purpose so that you have a feeling and maybe a reaction to just how um, much uh, we miss being here and filling up the church, or, or, or partially filling up the church. And to see it empty was startling and, and strange to you. That's the experience that I have every time I come up here, uh, to see all the empty pews, and how I long to be gathered back together with you God's people and worship to hear and sing and praise and to enjoy fellowship with each other. And so... Uh, we continue to pray for that and pray that uh, we will be allowed to gather together um, in the coming months. Our order of worship today, if you like to follow along at home, is Divine Service 4. It's page 203 in your hymnal. Otherwise, we'll have uh, some of it up on the, on the video, hopefully, uh, at least in terms of you being able to sing the words um, hopefully they'll be on the video this week. Last week I spent 10 hours, no, 12 and a half hours on Saturday trying to get the video the way I wanted it to look for you, and I never did get it accomplished and finally gave up, and at 11.30 last Saturday night I just posted what I had, and that's what you got to see. Hopefully today's will uh, work a little better, and uh, we'll be able to have the readings uh, or at least the hymns on the slides here for you. We begin our service by singing, Now All the Vault of Heaven rebound, Resounds, hymn 465. <laughs>
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive his grace through his life-giving word. Let us first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, and in word, and in deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as God's people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy, have mercy upon, upon us, us. Forgive, forgive us our sins, sins and, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I invite you to join with me in speaking the intro responsively. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron. Running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Glory, Glory be, be to the Father, Father and, and to the, the Holy, Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, and will be forever. Amen. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. We join in speaking the Kyrie together. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We join in singing the Gloria and Excelsius, our hymn of praise for the day. of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today comes to us from the, the second chapter of the book of Acts. 
And as you know, the, the book of Acts is kind of the sequel to Luke's gospel. Sometimes it's known as the Acts of the Apostles. Sometimes it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And in some ways, it's even the Acts of Jesus working through those he commissioned to be his ministers in the world. And we hear these words for the third Sunday of Easter. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to the Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join in the gradual. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the work of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. The epistle to reading today comes to us from the first chapter of uh, 1 Peter, beginning in verse 17. If you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you are ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fail, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the good news that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you as you stand in your homes to, to stand and uh, join with me in speaking the Alleluia in the verse. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, 
Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since those things happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They, went at the tomb, they were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying <clears throat> that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did our hearts not burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then they told them what happened on the road and how he is known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to join with me in confessing our baptismal creed, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now join in singing hymn 474, Alleluia, Jesus is...
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I know you're going to find this hard to believe, me being such a kind, sensitive guy, that sometimes I say things that are incredibly, well, stupid. Incredibly stupid and probably insensitive things. Now let me give you an example of what I mean. As I mentioned a while back, my wife has been planning this wonderful 30th anniversary trip for me and her to take to New York City. And she's put a lot of time and energy and resources into the planning of this trip. She's been online. She's looked at sites to go see. She's found museums that we want to go to. She's purchased tickets for Broadway plays, and she even bought tickets to a Yankees game. Even though we're not Yankees fans, we thought, New York, we got to see a Yankees game. So she bought tickets for that. She bought a, a, a ticket to take the train so that when we are done in New York City for a few days, seeing sights, eating wonderful food, visiting this great place, seeing Times Square and and all the lights and the glitz and glamour of New York City in a city that never sleeps. From there, the train was going to take us up to Niagara Falls, that most romantic of places, for our 30th anniversary. Now, in the face of COVID-19 and the pandemic, and, and especially as hard as that part of the country has been hit, there's almost no way that we are going to be going on that trip. So, here's what I said. I said, you know, hon, maybe, maybe it's not all about the destination, but the journey. And what I was trying to say is I know how much fun you've had getting this together, maybe that's enough. Maybe we don't need to actually get to New York City because you had so much fun planning the trip that the journey towards the destination was enough. Now, that is an incredibly stupid thing to say, right? Because ultimately, it's always about the destination. It's about the destination. How do I know that? How do you know that? Well, think about the trips that you've been on. Now, I know some of you grew up in the days where you drove your family around in a wood-paneled station wagon with back seats with no seat belts that folded out. The kids could lay down and sleep and make forts and pile blankets on top of each other and all that fun stuff. But when you were on those trips and the days got long and people were starting to get tired and cranky, you know, like 10 minutes after you got in the car and started going to grandma's house, one of them would always say, right, are we there yet? Which means we want to get to the destination. It's about the destination. Are we there yet? You may very well be asking yourselves those questions on this journey of life. Are we there yet? Because you're saying you have certain destinations you're trying to get to. Will you meet the right man or woman whom you're going to marry? Are we there yet? Will your dreams be realized for starting a family? Are we there yet? Have you met your career goals that you are on the path that you thought you would be at the you are at the point of your career where you want? Are we there yet? And along the way, there are all kinds of challenges that get in your way. Right now in our country, there's a lot of people saying, are we there yet? 
Are we there to that place where we can reopen restaurants and movie theaters and beauty salons and retail stores? Are we there yet? And some governors and mayors and stuff are saying, yeah, we're there. We're there. We've curbed it enough in our areas that we're going to open everything back up in the next week or two weeks or whatever it is. And there's others who are saying, no, we're not even close to being there yet. We've got months before life returns to normal. When you can go out and take in a baseball game and you can walk down through the coal store in the shoe aisle and have somebody help you. Are we there yet? Our journey leads to a destination. And St. Peter, in our text for today, has some Something to say for those who are asking these are we there yet questions. Peter says, and if you call on him, that's God, if you call on him as father, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time of exile. Throughout your time of exile. What's Peter saying? You're not home. You are not there yet. You are travelers. You are aliens. You are strangers. That's what this world is to you who call on God as Father. You are not yet home. And what's important about this trip, what he wants to remind them and remind us, is how to be good travelers on this journey during our time of exile. Because it's not always easy to travel well. As sinful people, we often get sidetracked. We find roadblocks. We run into hazards. We get stuck behind insurmountable obstacles, it seems like. We often travel rather poorly. When things aren't going the way we want, or the way we'd hoped, it's easy to do that, to travel poorly. We face a few obstacles. We run into roadblocks. We are overcome with despair. And we lose hope for the trip. We experience a few hazards along the way, a flat tire, a broken transmission and we develop road rage and we become angry and we act out in our rebellious sinful ways. We get stuck in traffic and we just want to exit and turn around and go back to the place from where we started. And if we travel poorly we can lose our cool and lose our focus and lose our purpose. We may even miss the whole point of this thing, and that is to get to a destination. And that's why I say, sometimes I say incredibly stupid things like, well, you know, it's not really about the destination. It's really about the destination. And so St. Peter offers some help for you and I as we make our way to that destination so that we travel well on the way. So that we make the most of this journey that we have towards our life with Christ at home with him in heaven. Listen to what he says in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you call on him as father... Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you are ransomed from the feudal ways that were inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. Peter says to travel well, 
travel with fear. Travel with fear. And you might say, well, I don't like that. I don't want to have a fear of God. God loves me. I'm not going to fear him. God's like a good grandpa. I'm not going to fear him. I want you to think of fear today like this. Do you remember those days when you were anticipating getting your driver's license? You're maybe 15, 15 and a half. Or just about to turn 16. Now in my day, in the mid-80s, they offered driver's ed, right? Now not everybody had to sit through driver's ed courses. So by show of hands, raise your hand if you had to take driver's ed. Well, I guess I can't see you, so I don't know. But keep your hands up if you had to take driver's ed. You notice my hand is not up. I think I was one of the last groups of people in the state of Colorado who were not required to take driver's ed to get their driver's license. I just had to pass the test. Now, the book that I had to study with to pass the test in many ways reflected what my friends who took driver's ed said. And that was they really wanted us to focus on defensive driving, right? It's driving with healthy fear. It's driving being aware of all your surroundings. It's driving not getting tunnel vision just on your own road or path, but to have your eyes up and scanning for the traffic coming in this lane and the traffic coming beside you and the, and the basketball rolling into the streets to be defensive, to, to not be distracted. Because driving a car, well, you should be safe. And you want the people around you to be safe. And to do that, you have to drive with a healthy fear. A healthy fear of your own life and the lives and the things going on around you. So that driving means everybody driving smartly and defensively. And they have this healthy dose of fear that this 6,000 pound vehicle can do all kinds of damage if it goes careening out of control. Right? So it's fun to drive, but that driving should be focused and undistracted and alert and to pay attention to everything going on. And that's how God calls us to live in this world. This world of sin. To be focused and undistracted and alert. Peter says that's how you travel this journey well. Because there are all kinds of practices in this world that will cause you to crash. There are habits that will hurt you and divide you from your family and your loved ones. There are attitudes that will drain your soul of hope. There are grudges and bitterness and anger that will leave you in the depths of despair and resentment. Traveling with fear means that you travel being alert to all of those hazards and hurts and distractions that can lead you off the road to your destination. And to do it, you listen to God's guidance. And you resist the temptations that would cause you to fall asleep at the wheel and go careening into a canyon. We don't just travel with a healthy fear of the potential potholes that might knock us off course. We ultimately travel with the excitement of the destination that is laid out before us. And with the wisdom of how to manage the trip. And with the knowledge that the trip and the destination are going to be special because God 
is with us all of the way and all of the time. First Peter says, Jesus was foreknown before the foundations of the world, but was made manifest in our last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. Jesus was manifest. He was made visible. He was made known as the Savior of the world. He made the journey from heaven down here to earth to, to give us a way back to the Father. So that our home is not here in this world. Our home is ultimately with God. And we are exiled down here for a time. But we are making our way home to be with him. As I preach this sermon, my wife is just driven on I-70 going from Colorado Springs to Grand Junction to help Hannah pack up some of her stuff as her school gets ready to, to send her home for the rest of the year. Now every time I drive that I-70 up through the twin tunnels, I'm amazed at just how impossible travel would be without the modern engineering feat of blasting out a mile of solid granite to put a road through there for us to travel on. Without that tunnel, it would be darn near impossible to take that route. And you know, sometimes in your lives, it feels like you're facing impossible obstacles as you journey through life. Maybe it's an impos impassable river of grief and stress and sorrow. Maybe it's a mountain of guilt and shame over that sin that you find yourself repeating even after you've told yourself, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. And you find yourself still doing it. There are times in this world when we are overwhelmed with our own inability to finish this journey that we're on. And that's the beauty of this message in God's word. God doesn't tell you to try harder or drive smarter or to take on water or the mountain that won't let you pass. God is in fact the engineer of our salvation and he makes a way for you and for me. On his terms and by his efforts he gives us a gift his son his son Jesus Christ the cross and the resurrection of Jesus are more than a tunnel under the water or through the mountains it's a highway back to God and it's a highway paved with grace through the spilled blood of the lamb slaughtered without wrinkle, spot, or blemish. It was paved by his death and offered toll free by his resurrection. And where God makes a way possible, where there is no way, well, you know, that's called grace. And when we understand and believe that, we can finish our journey well. We can travel well. And not only does this God make all of this possible, he offers us a destination beyond our wildest imaginations. You know, when you're traveling and the kids start complaining or you start fighting over directions with your wife or the GPS isn't working and you didn't put a map in and everybody's tense and nervous and all of that and 
and the mood gets ratcheted up in anger. You know, what happens when somebody says in the midst of all of that, boy, I can't wait till we get there. I'm so longing to see the beautiful blue waters of the ocean and the white sands of the beach and to put my feet up on the chair and to sip a nice beverage as I read my book and the sun comes cascading down and keeps me warm. Or the kid says, Dad, I'm so excited to get back to Magic Kingdom so we can ride the Matterhorn. I've heard about it from all of my friends. And I want to get there so much. And it kind of lifts the heavy, hurting mood. And that's what happens when we think about the ultimate destination. It gives us a sense of peace and a sense of joy and a sense of longing for what is to come. Yes, there are times on this journey when you might feel isolated and even alone. But in those times, know that God strengthens you with his Holy Spirit-filled word and sacraments. And he lets you know that you are never alone and that whenever you journey, guess who goes with you? Jesus. Jesus is with you. And on your journey, when you feel hopeless and disheartened, God's word reminds you that you have a worthy purpose on this trip to be ambassadors of his destination to all people. And when you grow weary and weary of the challenges of this journey in exile, God lets you know what awaits for you, abundant joy and peace and perfect happiness with him at home forever. Those who trust in Jesus travel this journey in fear, not dread, with hope, not despair, and above all, that those who travel this journey with faith and hope in God and in Jesus, his son, they are empowered by love. By a love that works itself in action for others along the journey. St. Peter's words say it this way, having purified yourselves by obedience to the truth for a sincere, brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Where do we get the strength to love others? Through the living and the abiding word of God. Because that abiding word of God that lasts forever is filled with Christ and what he has done. And Christ has loved you with an everlasting love. And that what Christ has done is conveyed in that living word that lasts forever. And that word then fills us with Christ's love. His love traveled to you and even now travels with you as Jesus himself promised to be with you every step of the way. You see, that Jesus became manifest for you. Yes, I know. As you journey, there are times when your tires go flat and it feels as though your car is broken down as your life has run out of strength and your spirit has become deflated. But know this, the word of the Lord remains forever. In the face of all this stuff that we see as temporary, the word of God stands forever and that is a word of love in Christ our Savior. And he is your constant traveling companion. 
God's love travels with you on your journey. And you can travel well as that love then flows into you and then out of you. Traveling well means that you show what you've received, that is the love of Christ. You let that love overflow into the lives of others. In fact, this journey we are on, it's not some boring journey. We don't always have to be asking, are we there yet? No, it's a journey where we travel with eyes wide open, looking for opportunities around us to be God's people for others. To stop and help those who are stranded. To give direction from God's word to those who are lost and cannot find their way. To enjoy the ride with our loved ones and friends as we get a glimpse of the joy even now that we will have in heaven when we are finally home. There is joy in the journey in this life with Christ. And so we put the pedal to the metal and Peter is challenging us today on this journey to travel well as one prepared, one focused, one alert and undistracted, one who receives the very grace of God in Christ, directed by the wisdom of God and his word, and with his presence and promise, guidance and strength, ready to love those around us with hope and love in Christ. By faith in him, we can travel well until we are finally home with the one who's made a way for you where there was no way. So rev up the engine and chart the course and give it gas by your faith in Christ. With faith in him, in hope and love, travel well, good friends. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray for the whole church, that the message of salvation joyfully be told throughout all the world and the Easter victory of Jesus be celebrated around the globe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the nations of the world, that the governments of all nations be a source of blessing to those who are governed, and that the oppression in all forms be hindered. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves in this season of our Lord's great victory, that we truly be Easter people all year long, radiating the light of Christ in our homes, workplaces, and communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who serve us through their callings, especially for those who deal with special challenges or dangers on a regular basis, including police, fire, and emergency personnel. And we also remember at this time the military forces of our nation, those stationed both home and abroad, whose efforts serve to defend our nation in challenging times. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those with special concerns and needs this day, for the hospitalized, for Jennifer Harper and Gary Holden. We pray for all of those who are recovering from illness and surgery, Lorraine, Marilyn, Graham, Gary and Carol, Pastor Widger, Chuck, Chuck and Darlene, Ron and Jennifer, Kathleen Herman, Lois, Mark, Marcine, Dennis, Norma, Walt, Paul, Darla, and Helen. We also commend to your care those who grieve, the unemployed and underemployed, the chronically ill and the shut-in, and all others whose needs are not known to us at this time. Bless them with your presence, gracious Father that they have a sense of victory in their lives and find strength and hope for each day. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
Gracious God, we give thanks for the countless health care workers and those whose jobs are essential and who put themselves in harm's way in the face of COVID-19. We ask that you would strengthen them for service to their communities and to the people that you've placed in their lives. We ask that you would grant to them health and safety from this disease that is ravishing the world. Keep them in your care and strengthen them in all ways. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful Father, we bless you for having placed into our lives faithful Christian people to guide us. On this day, we remember those no longer among us on this earth who have completed their earthly races and have won the final victory in Christ. Lead us to follow in their way that we rejoice together eternally at your table and in your mansions. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Her Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We join in our closing hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, Alleluia, hymn 460. 